And yes, after a long stretch of smooth sailing, the seas have indeed gotten rough again on Wall Street. In fact, the week of February 5th saw the Dow suffer two single day thousand point drops and the markets thereby officially entering correction territory. We've seen a partial rebound since then, but many analysts believe extreme volatility is here to stay. So the question becomes, what exactly does that mean for committed buy and hold investors? And what might it mean for fixed income investors who've already gotten off the stormy seas? It's time once again to tune out the hype and focus on the facts. Facts that matter to you, the income generation. Let's get started. Get ready to separate reality from myth. With us, David Scranton. David Scranton. David Scranton. David Scranton. But David Scranton says, hey, not so fast. How does it affect the market? How does it affect the economy? Thanks to efficiencies in new technology and a staff of veteran analysts and portfolio managers, Sound Income Strategy strives to set new standards and bring institutional style investing to your portfolio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton, your host. And yes, the recent weeks, early February, has come as kind of sort of a wake-up call for a lot of so-called stock market experts. The Dow and the S&P 500 both set records for rapid declines. Um, by Friday, the market overall ended up down by 10%, a big enough drop to officially be classified as a market correction. But the story within that story was about volatility which many experts believe is here to stay. But the question is why? And is volatility always a bad thing or can it trigger opportunities across all the financial markets? We'll talk about all that and much, much more with today's guests. But first, let's take a closer look at what's making all the waves on Wall Street right now. You know, we mentioned that the Dow started the week of February 5th with steepest point decline on record then ended the week having traveled more than 2,200 points over five sessions. At the same time, the S&P saw its biggest 10-day decline ever from a record high. Now, as you might recall, on my market forecast show just a few weeks ago, I said that I believe the markets would have another double-digit year this year. But I didn't know whether they were going to be on the upside or the downside. And yes, I know the year is early and we still have 10 months to go. We've already had a 6% climb in January followed by a double-digit drop in February. Wherever we end up, it's already shaping up to be a very, very bumpy year. In fact, last week, the VIX, the volatility index, which measures market volatility, spiked to over 50. That was its highest level in nearly two and a half years. And all this came as a shock to many investors, as analysts, be because big drops in volatility have been so infrequent over the last year, year and a half or so. In fact, the VIX, reached an all-time closing low on November 3rd and was still in the single digits in early January. Low volatility has actually paved the way for all those record market highs that we saw in 2017. You know, the Dow closed at 71 all-time highs last year, surpassing its previous record of 69 achieved in 1995. So what all changed? And is extreme volatility really the new norm for the stock market going forward, as some experts are saying? Well, we discussed some of the reasons for the initial plunge on last week's show, in particular fear over the possible effects of rising long-term and short-term interest rates, especially with the new Fed Reserve chairman now in charge. That fear had actually been building for quite a while now and was enhanced by a new Department of Labor report. This report showed that wages are increasing at their fastest pace in eight years. More jobs and higher wages, yes, they're a good thing, of course, but they also carry a potential threat of inflation. Increased inflation is indeed one of the benchmarks that the Fed is watching to determine when it's gonna make its next short-term interest rate hikes. Together, rising interest rates and rising inflation could stall economic growth, and, and Wall Street desperately needs that growth because, as I pointed out before, investors have already priced it into the market. Yes, it's true that we're seeing some corporate growth at this point. In fact, corporate earnings for the fourth quarter of last year were better than we've seen in a long, long time. But if you think about it, over 80% of S&P corporations have reported in the fourth quarter, uh, by February 9th that is, uh, with 74% of them had, had beaten bottom line fourth quarter estimates. 
earnings overall top analyst expectations by an average of 4.8 percent. Yet even as all these positive reports are coming in, the markets were tanking and volatility was spiking. The reason, I believe, is because stock prices are an indication of what investors are willing to pay for the future value of the markets and for future earnings growth, not present and certainly not past. Last year's rally was anticipation of the kind of growth that we're only beginning to see now. But the reality is we need to see a lot more of it before the stock market makes fundamental sense again. The stock market has to, in essence, grow into the prices that we saw as of the end of last year and beginning of this year. So if something should occur to slow that growth down or to sabotage it altogether, then the only way for the markets to make fundamental sense again is to have a significant pullback. And that is why the markets are suddenly showing all this volatility. And yes, may continue to do so. Investors are well aware that if factors like inflation and rising interest rates undermine continued GDP growth before the Republican tax cuts actually have a chance to really kick in, well then, the Wall Street party could end. But you know, there are other factors that could kill the party also. The delicate socio-political situations all around the globe and in fact, right here at home. No matter what you think about the Russian investigation or President Trump's handling of North Korea or Israel or NAFTA for that matter, there's no denying that these are all potentially issues that could evolve into something big, something that could at least, if, if it's not big, could still spook investors on Wall Street. We'll talk a bit more about some of that later on in our show with today's guests. A more pressing issue though that may help keep the market seas stormy for a while, is Donald Trump's new proposed $4 trillion budget, which some experts say should, could sharply increase the federal deficit. Supporters of President Trump's economic policies have downplayed these fears because they say that corporate growth triggered by the tax cuts will offset any potential debt increase. Now that may, yes, prove to be true. But in the meantime, the budget has plenty of critics and a long drawn out budget battle with ongoing threats of more government shutdowns is not likely to help lessen the volatility in the financial markets. In fact, quite the opposite. Ironically, the kind of volatility we're seeing now, and I believe we possibly could continue to see throughout the year, is a more normal state of affairs than what we experienced throughout all of last year. That was growth based purely on what we call a rational exuberance and almost entirely separate from reality. It's actually reassuring in many ways to see the markets that they're at least starting to acknowledge reality again. And there could even be an upside to it for certain types of investors. We'll talk about that a lot later in our show, and especially with our guests today. But there's also a big potential downside if the volatility worsens and segues into something more sustained. Stock market history tells us that it's not only possible but it's likely considering what the markets have done since the turn of the century. I'll talk about that a lot more on the show as well. And with that, let's welcome today's guest, Hatsi Langerer. Hatsi is an international commodities trader and investment banker with over 30 years of experience. He's also the author of the novel entitled Federal. It's a financial thriller about a bond trader who finds himself thrown into a maze of political and fiscal deceit surrounding, yeah, you might have guessed it, the Federal Reserve System. Hatsi, welcome to the show. David, thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. What are the major takeaways that you'd like to see our, our viewers be able to get from reading your book, to learn about the Federal Reserve? The main thing is, is that the public thinks that the Federal Reserve is a government agency, mm -hmm. and it is not. It's a private company whom we do not know the shareholders of, that cannot be audited, that doesn't pay taxes. Nonetheless, it runs our money, it decides what our interest rates are. It decides how much money is in the system. Mm -hmm. It controls the velocity of our money. It controls M1, M2, and M3. Those are money, money figures. Should the money supply, right? Money supply, and uh, they control our financial system. And mm -hmm. they are a private company. I believe we're the only country in the world where that's the case. And it's unbelievable that it was able to happen in 1913, which is when the Federal Reserve was created. So, so the question then is, you know, how, how do you feel that that really affects their policy, maybe in recent years, what things have been done different because of that. Uh, you know, let's talk about what's been happening. The Federal Reserve seems to be taking 
a more and more active role, it seems, than ever before. You know, we hear about them on the news virtually every day. They have made an effort after Greenspan to be core, to become more, <coughs> excuse me, to become more open, to become more transparent. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't happened. They say they are, but they're not doing it. We don't know whom they're dealing with. We don't know who their counterparties are. We do not know how much money is outstanding to foreign entities, we, nor do we know who those foreign entities are. We have no idea, nor do they want to tell us. They are very much secret in terms of what their balance sheet really is and who the shareholders are. We don't know who owns the Federal mm -hmm. Reserve. We don't know. Yeah. We do know that probably 60% is not American. So it sounds like, sounds like a situation that's potentially you know, ripe for conspiracy theory. Right. Now, now, I have to confess, I haven't had a chance to read your book yet. I am going to read it, though. Um, anything about the Federal Reserve is interesting to me, and if you could make it fun by putting it in a fictional format, that makes it even better. Right. Um, but is that part of it? Is a little bit of it the flavor of that there's a little chance or risk of conspiracy going on behind the scenes? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a novel. It's a, fictional, it's a fictional story about what happens to a bond trader, which is what I was, that through some fluke or some error in, in, in a settlement was able to get hold of uh, $25,000 worth of Federal Reserve stock. Actually, the, the act itself allows for that. Mm -hmm. It is possible. It just has never been done. And because he is an, becomes an owner, mm -hmm. he is invited into a meeting in Zurich and learns things that is not, is not designed for the public. And unfortunately, because you weren't that person, you weren't invited into that meeting, you can never know for sure whether or not that, you know, those things really happen. But it's, right. like you said, it's uh, nobody knows, so there's very little transparency. Very little. Let's talk about, since you're a bond trader, and obviously a lot of people who watch your show know that uh, we talk a lot about bonds and bond-like instruments. You know, what do you think about how the Fed's reacted over the last several years? What do you think about all the unprecedented levels of quantitative easing that have occurred? There is no defense against deflation. There isn't. Once deflation takes hold, it has to run its course. It's what happened in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, 38,900 was the top of their market. In 1989, it went down to 8,000. And they're still struggling along the bottom. It's because they experienced deflation. The Federal Reserve created a financial system that's based on inflation. Mm -hmm. They can manage inflation, and it's a right. system that is that we are familiar with. You know, the money becomes worth less over time, and but if it goes the other way, then debt stays the same, but assets drop, and this is disaster. So what they've done over the last ten years is to in to infuse incredible amounts of funds into the economy by keeping and, rates down. And, and the problem that happens, of course, is everybody reads the economics textbooks, which say that when you print money you create inflation. But all those textbooks assume one thing. They assume that all that printed money in circulation will be used to buy goods and services to stimulate the economy. And if it's not used for goods and services, if instead it's saved or used to pay off debt, then you're right, you get deflation instead of inflation. We have to take a quick commercial break. Stay with us, we'll be right back with more from my new friend, Hotsey. At the top of the show, I used a wave analogy to describe stock market volatility. And you know, it's a very fitting analogy because just like the ocean, the stock market's waves come in all sizes. They can be small and scary, but manageable, like the waves that surfers ride, or they can be huge and lethal. The problem is that the majority of stock market analysts, as well as advisors, focus only on the small waves. Now, there are reasons for that, which I've discussed on the previous shows many, many times, as well as in my books. In short, the system is skewed to a large extent to make optimism a necessary part of the financial industry. It's not anyone's fault, it's just how the system works. That being the case, it only makes sense that most of the financial media and most advisors would focus on the smaller, short duration waves. Why? Because they want to speak optimistically about the markets more often. They're not going to call attention to those giant, long-lasting, and potentially dangerous waves, but it doesn't mean that these large waves don't exist. To get a better understanding of these big waves, let's leave the ocean for a moment and let's head to the mountains. Back in the 1990s, before the internet, many brokers showed customers a graph of carefully picked data points called the mountain chart. Now this chart covered almost 70 years of stock market history, 
from 1926 into the mid-90s. And it was meant to show the impressive growth of the stock market over that time. And yes, it did exactly that. But it also showed something else if you bothered to take a closer look. It showed that in the midst of all that growth, there were many steep and long-lasting dips. In fact, many flat periods in the middle of the large periods of climb. You saw that the long-lasting dips came in on the heels of slightly long-lasting climbs, and that together these ups and downs unfolded in a repeating pattern of approximately 35 years. These are what I call stock market biorhythms, and are contained within them are those really big waves that few analysts or advisors ever talk about. And they go back a lot further than 1926, even though the mountain chart only goes back to 1926. In fact, they go back, these waves go back to the very beginning of the stock market. Now, our regular viewers know that I've talked quite a bit about stock market history on this show in the past. And the reason is that the closer you get to retirement, the more important it becomes to understand those larger waves, those larger cycles, and to know where the market stands within these current cycles. So here's a quick refresher course. From 1899 to now, the stock market has experienced extended periods of 10 to 15% growth, followed by slightly longer periods of zero net growth. These long-term secular bull and bear market cycles, respectively. The long-term growth or bull markets have lasted 10 to 15 years on average, while the zero growth secular bear markets have lasted, in many cases, in most cases, more than 20 years. What's interesting though is within each secular bear market cycle, historically speaking, the market's experienced at least three major drops and recoveries within it. That's why these cycles yield zero net growth for buy and hold investors who ride all those big waves from the top to the bottom each and every time. The major drops end up washing out the gain. So where are we today? Well, the last long-term secular bull market cycle was the longest ever, running from 1982 to the year 2000. That was when the markets crashed from 2000 to 2003, and that signaled the start of our current long-term secular bear market cycle. Then the market recovered from 2003 to 2017. Uh, in historic form, the second major drop occurred starting in 2007, bottoming out in 2009. And again, the market then recovered by 2013. But that's when something happened to interrupt the normal flow of history. I'm talking about, of course, the Federal Reserve's unprecedented overuse of government stimulus known as quantitative easing. Its influence has helped keep a third drop at bay since 2013. And it's still playing a huge role in influencing the markets as the Fed starts to unwind quantitative easing by selling back all the bonds that it had purchased in previous years. We'll talk about that a lot more in today's show. The bottom line though is that volatility like what we're experiencing now, um, and we've experienced that volatility off and on ever since the year 2000 and in every secular bear market before that. It's your typical cyclical volatility. You could think of it as the smaller waves within a bigger wave. And here's why it's so incredibly important for investors over the age of 50, income generation members, to understand and be aware of these bigger waves, even though most advisors want to focus on the smaller ones. You know, as I pointed out last week, consider that since the turn of the century, buy and hold stock market investors have experienced an average return of a little bit over 5%. Why? Because of those two giant crashing waves. Those two major stock market crashes, the one that started at the beginning of the year 2000 when the tech bubble burst, and the one that started in 2007 with the financial crisis. They washed out all the previous gains and forced investors to start building again from square one. And you know that process takes time, that rebuilding. Remember, it took seven years for the market to recover from to its previous peak after the 2000 drop and six years after the 2008-2009 drop. Six and seven years just to break even again and start building. Now, obviously, if you're within 10 years of retirement, that's not a position that you want to find yourself in financially. Time just isn't on your side after a certain age, as we all know. So the question becomes, could the return to volatility we're seeing in the markets now be a sign that the third major market drop is on the way? Could these smaller waves usher in the bigger wave? 
Well, no one knows for sure, of course. But keep in mind that we're still less than 20 years in this secular bear market cycle. And that third major drop still has plenty of time to get here. And the odds are that it won't get here are mathematically very slim. I'll talk about that a lot more later on in the show. Now it's time to welcome back Hatsi Langerer. So we know what the Federal Reserve has done, right? The Federal Reserve just printed more money, tried to get the economy stimulated. They, they, they got us out of the financial crisis, but it wasn't, didn't stimulate to the extent that they wanted. But now they're all trying to reverse it all. What effect do you think that's had on what's happened over the stock market over the last couple of weeks and what's happened with interest rates, like interest rates on the 10-year Treasury? Of course, they have to raise rates. Um, I believe the GDP will come out at 5 plus. Um, if that happens, they have to raise rates. The GDP will come out at 5 plus? That's numbers that I'm hearing. Wow. So. I mean, I, I'm a fan of President Trump, and most of our viewers are a fan of President Trump, but his goal was 4% GDP. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. I mean, we'll wow. find out. But even if it's 4% or more, you have more confidence in him than he even does it himself. That's pretty impressive. That would be difficult. That could be yes, difficult. I do have exactly. confidence in him. <laughs> but, but what will happen, they'll have to raise rates to slow down the economy. They will have to do this, which you've already seen. The slide over the last couple of weeks on the Dow portrays that. It was down a couple of thousand, and it's on its own, it's not a big number percentage-wise. Um, but that's what they're going to have to do. The cost of money is going to have to go up. Yeah. And it's interesting because what's helping push the cost of money go up longer term you know, is the fact that, you know, last year the Federal Reserve, we think we talked about this last week or the week before on the show, last year the Federal Reserve actually, not the Federal Reserve, the government actually issued over 500 billion of government bonds. They borrowed over 500 billion. This year they're talking about borrowing almost a trillion. Right. Now it's not clear whether that includes enough money to replace what's rolling off the Fed's balance sheets, but that increase of supply should raise long-term rates and we've finally seen it. Right, and you know, what, whatever the Fed will do, it's, what people don't take into consideration that there's another balance sheet that the Fed is running with, which is, which is the reserve currency. Mm -hmm. So we have, what's our debt? 16, 17 trillion, something, or maybe 20 trillion? 20 trillion on the books. On the books. So but how about the part that's off the books, right. all the unfunded trillion, liabilities? Right, correct. So, but let's, what's on the books? What we don't count with is, is what is our real, what is our real dollar exposure, including the reserve currency? Mm -hmm. And it's over 100 trillion. Yeah. That's why it is so important that oil stays in dollars, that gold, that all the commodities stays quoted in dollars. I mean, the countries that have stopped selling their commodities in dollars was Iraq. Well, we know what happened there. Yeah. It was Libya. Guess what happened there? So it's not a good idea to do this. So um, we all know Bitcoin, of course, is going to be the new reserve currency and save the world. We could talk about that if you'd like as soon as we come back from our commercial break. Stay with us, please. We have a lot more from my new friend, Hatsi Langer. We'll be right back. If you're near or in retirement, head over to theincomegeneration.com and download your special report written specifically for the needs of the income generation. I'm David Scranton, and you've been watching The Income Generation. Hello, I'm Miranda Kahn. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the stories that move the markets this week. Warren Buffett's investment firm, Berkshire Hathaway, bought more shares from the generic drug maker, Teva Pharmaceutical Industries, and more shares of Apple. The company filed its stock holdings from the end of last year. It shows that it owns nearly 19 million shares of Teva, which is worth more than $350 billion. Last month, Berkshire said it would work with Amazon and JP Morgan to create their own healthcare company. Meanwhile, Amazon could be gearing up to become the go-to source for basic medical supplies such as latex gloves, bandages, and sutures. The online marketplace wants to focus on outpatient clinics, which includes everything from doctor's offices to surgery centers. Big hospital systems have been rapidly buying up medical practices as they move into the outpatient care market. And President Trump reportedly supports a 25 cent gas raise tax to fund his infrastructure plan. A White House official tells Axios that it's one option he's considering, but everything is on the table to fund his one and a half trillion dollar proposal. The hike could result in more than 375 billion more dollars in tax revenue over the next decade. For more on these stories, visit Newsmax.com slash finance. Now let's get back to the income generation with David Scranton.
We're going to have a bear market again, and it will be the worst in our lifetime. That's a noted market analyst Jim Rogers of Rogers Holdings Incorporated told Bloomberg News not too long ago. And if he's right, it means the stock market would have to take even a steeper drop than the 54% correction that occurred from 2007 to 2009. Now that may sound somewhat alarmist, but it can actually make sense when you understand the history of the stock market. In addition to every long-term secular bear market cycle experiencing at least three major drops, it's also not uncommon for each successive drop to be bigger than the one before it. We've even seen that already within our current cycle, in which the second drop was, yes, indeed, steeper than the first. And this occurs oftentimes through a process we call waves of capitulation. You see, with each successive drop, bigger investors start to capitulate and join in the sell-off. An investor, for example, might be able to afford to hang on there for one major downturn, but might decide that he doesn't really want to or can't hang in there for two. And an investor who could ride out two might decide he can't afford to, afford to endure three. The end result, obviously, is a bigger sell-off and a steeper market plunge each time as wealthier investors are selling off a greater dollar amount of investments into each market drop. Of course, neither I nor Jim Rogers nor anyone can say definitely that this is the third major drop and that it started now, or pinpoint for that matter when it will start. But with five to seven years still left in the secular bear market cycle, odds are that it will not occur within that time are, well, I believe, slim to none. Part of my rationale for believing that the third market drop for this secular bear market cycle is imminent has to do with the Guinness Book of World Records. Let me ask, how many of you know someone personally who set a world record and has a place in that book? I certainly don't, and I'm guessing that probably not many of you do either. Now, how many of you know someone who set two world records? Probably even fewer. How about somebody who set three world records? Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that probably none of you know someone who set three world records. Why? Because the odds of doing that for anyone or anything are extremely minute. Now, please keep that in mind when I talk about this third major market drop, which has yet to occur. Because if, in fact, it does not occur, then our current secular bear market cycle will, yes, hold three places in the book of world records. First, it will hold the record for the shortest secular bear cycle ever recorded at just 13 years. This is based, of course, when the market recovered to its previous peak in 2013 after its second major drop. It would be the first secular bear market cycle to finish without experiencing three or more major drops within it. And last, it would be the first time in recorded history a secular cycle, secular bear market cycle ended before P.E. ratios had shrunken back down into the single digits. Average P.E. ratios right now are still in the high teens or low 20s, depending upon which method you use to calculate them. So could all of this occur? Could this current long-term bear market cycle make history three times over? Of course it can. Anything's possible. But the question, according to history, is, is it probable? Or is it a real long shot? And if it's the latter, then do you want to gamble your life savings on a long shot? Of course, neither I, nor Jim Rogers, nor anyone could predict exactly when the next major market drop will start. And I'm not going to say I know for sure it's going to be steeper than the previous drop, even though that is a common pattern throughout history. Let's face it, for it to be bigger than the previous drop, you know, the next one would have to hit about a 75% drop from the peak we saw at the end of January. And that's pretty extreme. But in order to get below that ceiling, that, that glass ceiling, that resistance level that existed from 2000 to 2013, this next drop would have to be at least 45%, which I do believe is not only very possible, but quite probable. Possible and probable and certainly capable of doing plenty of damage for those members of the income generation who end up getting caught in the downdraft. Now let's welcome back one more time my new friend, Hatsi Langerer. Thank you. I was just kidding. I, I didn't want to talk about Bitcoin, really. I, I, Bitcoin kind of bores me. But, but uh, interest rates. So it's interesting. You know, why do you think with five interest rates increases by the Federal Reserve on the short-term side, why do you think it, it, it took until really January for the bond market to come out of a coma and for long-term yields to increase? I think what happened with the tax reform 
is that a lot of people got a lot, not a lot, got money, more money. It is perception that drives the economy. And the perception is that they're going to be richer, better off a year from now than now. That will stimulate the economy, it'll stimulate, it'll stimu stimulate uh, uh, demand, which is basically 75% of GDP. And that's why all of a sudden we see this increase in, in movement, in interest rates. We see this increase in, in, in purchase power. Big companies are bringing money back to the United States. Yeah. All that is very, very, very positive. So the stock market throughout all 2017 arguably was running off half drunk, uh, optimistic, uh, anticipating that the, the tax reform was going to go through. In the bond market, they said the bond market is smarter than the stock market. I think you probably believe that being an ex-bond trader. <laughs> so finally, the bond market wanted to wait. They're from Missouri. They said, okay, seeing is believing now that it's through. Now we're going to get growth, and that's why rates started to come up. So the question becomes now, where do they level off? Um, do they level off in the low threes? And if so, then where do they eventually go? And I don't what's know. your best guess? I don't know the answer for that. What I do know is that markets find Come extremes. Come on, you're the expert. You've been trading bonds the longer than I have. Market finds extremes. So the extreme is going to be wherever ultimately the, 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 the market says it's enough. Um, we could very well go to high fives, high six, and high sevens. Who knows? Yeah. It depends on how, how well the economy takes off. It depends how well the consumer wants to buy new products. Mm -hmm. How many new houses are being built? Is, is the housing market for real or not? But that's what you're talking about is the component of long-term interest rates that has to do with forward-looking growth prospects. Mm -hmm. And I get that. However, there's another part of it, and that's demand for bonds. You know, we have an aging population, baby boomers. Are you, you, you and I are right there, yes. who are, have an increasing demand for income-based investments like bonds. Correct. You know, does that have the potential to offset this and maybe cap it so. out at a lower rate? I don't believe that that is such a, I don't believe that that is the big part of the economy. It's a part, but it's not the one that drives the economy. What drives the economy is, is, is big multinationals. It is other nations, other governments, other, other government agencies that they're the big buyers. They're the ones that will look at it and say, is it, does it make sense on a geopolitical basis to buy the 10-year right now and hold it for five, six, seven years, whatever the duration is? So if we really want to know how high the rates are going to go and when it's going to happen, we really have to look at what various governmental entities are doing. Maybe go back and look at with Chinese government if they still have an appetite for our bonds. And, Chinese and are not going to sell their bonds. They're not going to sell our bonds. No, they're not. Absolutely they're not. not. It's, it's ludicrous to think so. They'd be, they shooting, own, yeah. they'd be shooting themselves in the foot. It Especially really would, so. now what's going to happen where, where Trump is going to change the way we do business with them. Yeah. You know, yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. Yeah, so. Listen, we need to leave it there, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, all good things must come to an end. Thank you for being on the show. It's been wonderful. It was an honor. Thank you very much, David. All right. Well, stay with us. We'll be right back with a lot more. If you're near or in retirement, head over to theincomegeneration.com and download your special report written specifically for the needs of the income generation. I'm David Scranton, and you've been watching The Income Generation. So what then, if anything, does the return of stock market volatility mean for the bond market? Well, we discussed this on last week's show, and the most important message to keep in mind is that the bond market, by its very nature, simply does not experience the same kind of volatility that the stock market does. It never fluctuates as dramatically, either on the upside or the downside. You know, rather than an ocean where the challenges are large and small waves, you can think of the bond as a calmer body of water, where the challenge is the current, which is sometimes moving with you and sometimes moving against you. And this is primarily because of the inverse relationship between bond values and interest rates. Rising interest rates can be an opposing current for bond investors. But with actively managed fixed income portfolio, you can drop anchor to keep from losing ground in that situation. And also through active management, you can move forward again when the current shifts and is in our favor once again. I bring this up because, as I discussed at the top of the show, one of the main reasons for the return of the volatility in the stock market is the fear of rising interest rates. Interest on the 10-year Treasury yield has climbed from 2.4 at the start of the year to 2.9% currently. That gives the Federal Reserve a bit more wiggle room to hike short-term rates without flattening out the yield curve. And that, along with inflation, has Wall Street nervous because of what it might mean for the economy. But the more important question for fixed income investors who have already reduced their market risk is, will long-term rates continue to rise or will they level off? 
how long will the opposing current last and will it get stronger? Theoretically, it should get stronger as the Federal Reserve continues the process of unwinding quantitative easing. We've discussed this before. That will keep the bond supply high, keeping prices low, and theoretically driving interest rates even higher. But as I said last week, I believe that the 10-year Treasury might make it up to maybe three and a quarter at this point, and then stop, and then maybe even pull back for a while. Why? Because it can hit a very strong resistance level at that point. And the main reason I believe this is because Americans in our age group, income generation members who have been burned twice by the crashing stock market, are going to remain committed to less risky, less volatile investment strategies. In other words, the demand for bonds is rising. And I believe that that demand has to at least partially offset the increased supply of bonds, thus holding interest rates at a reasonable level. Now, will they eventually get up above three and a quarter? Absolutely. But in terms of short term, the next several months, I think that's a pretty strong resistance level that's likely to hold. So I firmly believe that all the so-called bond vigilantes out there that are predicting the bursting of some so-called bond bubble are just another variety of what I like to call stock market cheerleaders. People who are pro-stock market like to talk about how great it is and like to put down the bond market whenever they possibly can. Personally, most of them just don't know what they're talking about when it comes to fixed income. So now it's time to welcome our next guest to the show, a repeat guest whom I'm sure you'll recognize, my good friend Jeff Small, the president of Arbor Financial Group in Melbourne, Florida. And he's also the author of the book entitled Turning Financial Planning Right Side Up. Thanks for being on the show, Jeff. Hey, Dave. It's great to see you. Hey, so... What's going on with this stock market volatility? You know, we've talked about there being another drop, and some people have said, uh, one of the advisors that I work with actually said, well, he thinks it's like 2008, he's ready to short the market. I personally think it's a little bit like uh, we saw maybe in 1998, where it was a short pullback, but we might have another year of positive growth in the market before we get the big drop. What are your thoughts? Well, who says we can't have rising interest rates and rising equities as long as fundamentals are sound? What happened the other day, Dave, with the 10% correction in the Dow and the 5% drop in the S&P really shaked the euphoria out of the market. And we were really due for a pullback after climbing 40% since President Trump was elected. So, so you think that the market got ahead of itself, it got up over its skis? You know, instead of building another 10% anticipation of the tax cuts going through, it built on another 20, 30%. So now it's just kind of getting back to normal. It's digesting that market growth. It really is. And, and don't forget that in January, we were up 7.5%. So the short-term market looks really strong. Bullishness is returning, as we can see. The market's climbing back from the bottom from last week. So you agree with me, then? You think that this isn't the big one? Yeah, I know you, we've talked enough to th say that I know you believe that down the road we need to have a pretty significant pullback, but you think this market's got more legs? I think the market has more legs, but I think as we gap up between three and a quarter and three and a half, we run the risk of more volatility. And there will be more volatility, even though today rates were spiking on the 10 year and the market really just kind of smiling at it and didn't really care. At some point, that'll become a factor again. So you think that eventually interest rates will affect the market. How high do you see the interest rates going on the 10-year before the end of this year? What's, what's your best guess as, to, as a number? Well, I think we're looking at three to four rate increases in the next 12 months. They're going to add a quarter percent per rate increase. So we'll see rates 12 months out at least 1% higher from here. And the Fed's goal, of course, is to raise rates another 1% from there, which I think ultimately mm. would be devastating to the economy and the markets. So now when we get back to the commercial break, I'm going to ask you what you think that's going to do, how it's going to translate to long-term interest rates. So Jeff, stay with us. And you too, stay with us. We have a lot more from Jeff Small here on the Income Generation. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Income Generation. It's time to bring back our guest, Jeff Small, author of the book, Turning Financial Planning Right Side Up. So Jeff, I know you answered the question before the break on short-term rates, but let's face it, over the last couple of years, short-term rates have gone up a one and a quarter percent. Long-term rates haven't gone up by that much. So how do you think those three or four increases throughout the rest of 2018 on the short-term side, how do you think that'll translate into increases on a longer-term rate, such as the 10-year Treasury? Well, the Fed is hoping 
that the rates, the disparity in rates between the 30, the 10 year and the two year actually gets wider. Because if we get within an inverted yield curve scenario, the last seven times the curve is inverted, we've had seven for seven recession. This is what I love about you. Just because, you, just because you're from the space coast, nobody could ever accuse you of being a space shot. See, you're trying not to let me trap you into a number, but Jeff, come on, play ball with me here. You heard me, I went out on a limb just a moment ago in front of millions and millions of viewers, and I said, I think three and a quarter is the highest we're gonna see in the next six months. That's a strong resistance level. You know, what's your number? What would you, what's your best guess then, short term, as to where that'll go? Maybe by the end of the year. I think by the end of the year, we're at three and a half. Okay, by the end of the year, you're gonna be up to where? Three and a half on the 10-year note. Okay. Yeah, I, okay, so you and I aren't too far apart with that. That's good. But now, of course, you have the issue, as you just said, if we only gain another 0.6% in essence on the 10-year, but a whole 1% on the short end, now you have that flat yield curve problem. You know, the difference right now between the two-year and the 30-year is only 1%, and that's not that much. It really isn't, and, and investors really need to pay attention to that because if that gap starts to shorten or get closer in nature, there's gonna be pullbacks in the market and more volatility. And I see pullbacks happening anyway between three and a quarter and three and a half as the 10 year gaps up from three and a quarter. So bottom line, what can investors expect to earn today? You know, the bond vigilantes say, well, you can only get two, 3% in bonds and they're gonna come crashing down when interest rates go up, which you know we know is not, not the way it works. The question then becomes, you know, what do you tell investors? If not two, 3%, what can they reasonably get investing in diversified portfolio of bonds and bond-like in instruments, and investing for income instead of growth? Well, if you want to stay within the triple B range, I mean, you're going to be between four, three and a half, four and a quarter percent. There's good bonds out there to find. If you go one letter below with two Bs in the, in the equation, you might be four and a half, five, five and a half, and there's good companies out there, but you've got to work with a qualified investment advisor that has access to that marketplace. And what investors have to really understand, Dave, is that interest rates are a cycle. And right now they're going to cycle up. They're going to peak probably in 12 to 24 months or less. And then they're going to cycle back down as business starts to calm down right. after the Trump bump. That's right. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I tend to agree with you on everything you said there. And it's why you wrote the book, Turning Financial Planning Right Side Up, because you know, most people think you'd only get 2 or 3% in a bond portfolio, and you and I know better. So, Jeff, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy day to be with us. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank today's guest for joining us another episode of the Income Generation. I'd also like to thank you, our new and, yes, especially returning viewers. As the stock market settles into what might be a prolonged new period of unsettledness and volatility, I hope you keep a few things in mind. First, that what we're seeing now with the markets focused on real economic developments is really a more normal state of affairs than what we saw all last year when the market soared based purely on hope and optimism. Second, that these daily, weekly, and even monthly ups and downs are cyclical market patterns that the small waves contained within the long-term secular market cycles. These longer-term cycles play out over decades. And third, that investors over the age of 50, members of the income generation, should understand and be aware of these long-term secular cycles if they want to improve their odds of avoiding a major financial loss close to or during retirement. And fourth, that the odds of our current long-term secular bear market cycle ending without a third or even fourth major market correction is extremely remote. And yes, would be considered as three world records, unprecedented world records regarding the stock market. And finally, that you don't have to endure the dangerous ocean waves in order to have a successful retirement plan. In fact, there are better and smarter options where the sailing is smoother, safer, and ultimately more pleasant. Thanks for watching. If you're close to retirement and really want to know how to protect and maximize your money, it's absolutely essential that you stay informed and up to date. And right here is where you can do it with us on The Income Generation. I'm David Scranton, and thanks again. We'll see you next week. Read David J. Scranton's groundbreaking new book, Return on Principle, Seven Core Values to Help Protect Your Money in Good Times and Bad.
discover practical solutions to the financial challenges facing today's generation of retirees and near retirees. Learn the truth about Wall Street, the financial media, and the secrets they try to hide from everyday investors. This isn't just another book about investing. Working Americans who have lived through two major stock market crashes and the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression in the past 16 years don't need another book about investing. David Scranton's approach to financial planning is a holistic system designed for maximum protection, strategic growth, and reliable income regardless of market conditions. Stop planning for retirement with your fingers crossed. Read Return on Principle, Seven Core Values to Help Protect Your Money in Good Times and Bad. Available now.